I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine YouTube channel. Today I continue with Section 5.5, Coup d'etat, by Edward Lutwak. We're picking up in Chapter 2, When is a Coup d'etat Possible? Organic Unity In looking at the political consequences of economic backwardness, we saw that the crucial element in these was the concentration of all power in the hands of a small elite. Conversely, in sophisticated political units, power is diffuse and therefore difficult to seize in a coup. We now face another possible obstacle to a coup. Power may be in the hands of sectional forces who use the government as a front, or regional forces whose dependence on the supposed political center is only theoretical. In both these cases, the problem lies in the fact that the seizure of the supposed political center will not win the battle. The sources of political power may be in other centers, which may be too difficult and or numerous to seize. In both these instances, the realities of power are in conflict with the theoretical structure of the state, just as in the cases where the political unit is not truly independent. Here, power is within the country, but not where it is supposed to be, not in the instance because the unit is unsophisticated enough to diffuse power through subsidiary entities, but because the unit is not really organic. Sectional Interests This is the age of the giant business enterprise. The same factors which have led to the unprecedented prosperity of the modern industrial economy have also systematically favored the larger business organization. Mass production and mass distribution imply large business units. Where the advantages of large-scale production are particularly great, as in the automobile and the chemical industries, only the very large enterprise can survive. Elsewhere, where there is no such economic imperative, the giant corporation has developed because of the economies of large-scale marketing, or simply because of the natural dynamics of accumulation. In every industrially developed economy, there are such firms, ICI in Britain, General Motors in the United States, Philips in the Netherlands, and Fiat in Italy, are all firms which have been able to grow sufficiently to emerge from the rest of industry and to become one of its focal points. This position gives them a great deal of economic power because their managerial decisions can affect the entire national economy. In political terms, however, the power of the giant corporation is just one more element within the business community, and this in turn is just one of the forces competing in the political life of the nation. The corporation may be a giant, but it's a giant amongst many. It is otherwise in economically underdeveloped countries. If the ability of mineral deposits or of particular crops leads to the development of industry, then because of the nature of these sectors, there will be one large firm rather than many small ones. There is by definition little or no other industry. The tax revenues will be small, except for the company's taxes. And there will be very few jobs going, except for the company's jobs. If there are roads and railways, they will have been built by the company as company transport facilities. Most of the schools and hospitals will be company welfare services. Company housing may dwarf the capital city. And company security guards may be better equipped than the national police. When the state is poor and fragile, the rich and well-organized mining or plantation company will be a great power in the land, whether it seeks or avoids this power. In fact, it will almost always be forced to intervene in politics if only to preserve some status quo. When the company acts, it has a wide range of different weapons it can use, and it can use them at many different levels. The company can slow the flow of tax income to the state by transferring production to some other country in which it operates. It can boost a particular politician by giving real or sinecure jobs to his supporters. It can buy or bribe the press and generally exercise the power it derives from being very rich amongst the very poor. What an industrial empire can do when set in a backward environment was illustrated by the Katanga secession in the early 1960s. When Tshombe launched his independent Katanga Republic, he had only the meager resources of a provincial governor of the Congolese Republic. Yet, as the secession proceeded, Tishon Bey acquired an army with jets, heavy weaponry, armored cars, as well as well-organized propaganda bureaus in London and New York. He was able to recruit and pay very handsomely mercenary soldiers and administrators. Katanga has only one major source of wealth, the mining industry owned by the Union Manier, part of the interrelated mining groups which operate in the Copper Belt in South Africa. It does not need a Peking propaganda pamphlet to convince us that Tishon Bey was financed by the Union Manier, and largely acting as an agent for the company. But even the Union Minerie was operating in what was a relatively unfavorable environment. The Congo is a large country, and there are many mineral deposits worked by other companies with different interests to protect. The typical large-scale enterprise operates in countries where it's the only major industry. Thus Aramco, the oil company working in Saudi Arabia, is the only major industrial organization in the country. 
Its company town, built to house employees, dwarfs other cities in the area. Its taxes constitute almost 90% of government revenue, and it has been responsible for the building of the most educational transport and medical facilities in the country. The Saudi regime has always been efficient at retaining political control over what was until recently a loose coalition of tribes. The old desert warrior and founder of the kingdom, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud, was a past master at controlling the tribes, and he treated Aramco just as another tribe. Nevertheless, it is clear that Aramco is a particularly powerful tribe. A standard nationalist accusation against the large-scale foreign enterprise is that it is a state within a state, and that it exercises political power either through its direct control of the country's government or by using the leverage of its home country on the host country. The United Fruit Company has often been accused of exercising power through corrupt local cliques, while the oil companies in the Middle East have been accused of using both methods. A much less plausible accusation against the foreign company is that it engages in covert activities against the state, such as sabotage and espionage. Just why it should undertake such activities is not explained, but such accusations are widely believed. When the new regime of Husni al-Zaim was set up in Syria in 1949, one of its first actions was to limit the freedom of action of the Iraq Petroleum Company. IPC was informed that A. Its aircraft would have to obtain official permits for each flight. B. That the company's security forces would have to be replaced by public security forces. And C. That company personnel would need official permits to travel in the border zones. However, unfounded the allegations of complicity in espionage, which were the supposed reasons for the rules, it should be noted that such restrictions, except for the last ones, are commonplace in most developed countries. Even if the foreign country has no desire to interfere in the political life of the host country, it may be forced to do so merely in order to protect its installations and personnel. Typically, this is the case when the company is operating in areas which are not under the effective control of the de jure government, especially in remote areas inhabited by minority groups, or, which may amount to the same thing, controlled by local insurgents. The French rubber plantation companies in South Vietnam, for example, have often been accused of financing the Viet Cong. There's no reason to impute sinister motives to them, because since the official government, which also collects taxes, is unable to guarantee law and order, the French plantation companies are simply paying their taxes to the de facto government. The experience of the British oil company in Persia, originally Anglo-Persian, later renamed Anglo-Iranian, and finally British Petroleum, before becoming part of the Iranian Oil Consortium, illustrates the case of a business enterprise which was forced to intervene in the domestic affairs of the host country under the pressure of local political realities. Anglo-Persian received its concession from the Persian government in 1901, but it soon discovered that the Tehran government had very little control over the remote areas where the company was actually exploring and later producing oil. The Sheikh of Mohammara controlled the area at the heads of the Persian Gulf, and the Neo-Mongolian Bukhtiari Khans controlled the rest of Kuzikstan. Both the Sheikh and the Khans were nominally subject to the Tehran government, but in fact independent. The company accepted local political realities and, in order to protect the safety of its installations, entered into arrangements with the local rulers. The British government, however, tried to regularize the situation by supporting the autonomy of the Sheikh against the central government. And the company, being closely associated with the government, identified itself with the autonomy of the Sheikh. When Reza Pahlavi took power in Persia and restored the authority of the central government, the company found itself penalized for its support of the Sheikh. The relationship between the company and the Bakhtiari Khans was even more complicated. The company realized that its wells and pipelines could only be protected by coming to an arrangement with the local de facto power. This time, however, instead of one sheikh, there were many different Khans, all involved in the mutual conflict of tribal politics, with only loose coalitions whose instability prejudiced the security which the company had bought. The natural solution was adopted. The company, together with British consular authorities, entered into tribal politics in order to promote a paramount chief who would clarify and stabilize the situation. The feuds among the Khans, however, were never concluded, and the tribal politics of the company were only brought to an end when the central government of Reza Pahlavi disarmed the Khans and restored its control over the area. Thus the company, merely in order to protect its installations and to avoid paying double taxation to two rival authorities, had to enter politics at three different levels. It operated in tribal politics to promote and maintain the power of the paramount chief of the Bakhtari, in national politics it, to preserve the autonomy of the Sheikh of Mohammara against the central government, in international politics to detach the Sheikh them from Persia, acting in association with the Br British consular authorities in the Gulf. What action must be taken by the planners of the coup in the event of the presence of such sub-states in the target country? In a few extreme cases, their consent may be ne necessary, 
They tend to have their ears to the ground and will probably be aware of the coup before the official intelligence outfits. This consent can be attained by a suitable mixture of threats and promises, and in this case promises do not always have to be kept. Elsewhere they will act as just one more factor with which the coup has to deal, but increasingly, after the political education they have received at the hands of the nationalist forces everywhere, foreign business interests have learnt that neutrality is sweet. Regional Entities The essence of the coup is the seizure of power within the main decision-making center of the state, and through this, the acquisition of control over the nation as a whole. We have seen that in some cases, the decision-making process is too diffused through the entire state bureaucracy and the country at large. In other cases, the supposed political center is controlled by another, foreign center, or by sectional forces which are independent of the whole state machinery. A similar problem arises where power is in the hands of regional or ethnic blocs, who either use the supposed political center as an agency for their own policies, or ignore the claims of the center and regard themselves as independent. Practically every Afro-Asian state has border areas, typically mountainous, swampy, or otherwise inaccessible, which are inhabited by minority tribes, and where the control exercised by the government is only theoretical. Where this sort of de facto autonomy extends to major population centers, the problem of the lack of organic disunity arises. It is, however, of no importance for the coup if the organic unit is in itself large. The new regime can deal with local autonomies when it has seized power. Sometimes, however, the local units are so powerful that they control the center, or else the center rules only the immediate suburbs of the capital city. This was often the case in the Congo in the period 60 to 64, following independence and the mutiny of the force publiques. Though the Congolese Republic was constitutionally a unitary and not a federal state, it quickly lost control of most of the provinces, which behaved as totally independent entities. Within each province, local factions were in conflict, but the central government's faction tended to be one of the weakest. Political Situation in South Kasai in 1960-61 The following groupings were contending for the control of the province. A. The traditional chiefs, forces available tribal warriors. B. The South Kasai separatists led by King Kalonaji, forces available well-equipped undisciplined troops led by Belgian officers. C. The central government, forces available young and inexperienced administrators with loose control over the small national army contingent in the eastern part of the province. D. The mining company... Form Minenier, resources available, financial support and air transport occasionally made available to colonists in other groups. The situation in Katanga was even more unfavorable to the central government. The northeast of the Stanleyville area were in the hands of the Gizinga forces. Much of the rest of the country would not be reached by government officials because of the breakdown in law and order, and the disruption of transportation facilities. Thus, a successful coup in Leopardville, now Kinshasa, would only have one control of a very small fraction of the Great Congolese Republic. Several different coups would have been needed in the various de facto capitals, Stanleyville, Elizabethville, Louisburg, etc., in order to control the whole country. Federal states represent the overt and constitutional recognition that regions have a local power base and are therefore granted a corresponding measure of local autonomy. In some cases, the power of the center comes from the voluntary union of the regions, and until the central institution develops its own sources of power and authority, it is the regions that rule, only using the center as an agency for their common policies. The United States was the product of a more or less voluntary union of states, and until the development of presidential authority in the course of the 19th century, the government in Washington was little more than an agency for the common problems of the states. Thus, a coup staged in Washington in, say, 1800s would have seized an empty symbol, but by 1900, the development of federal authority was such that a coup would have led to control over much of the country. The Soviet Union, Canada, India, and West Germany are all federal states, but the degree of autonomy of each component state or province varies from the near zero of the USSR to the increasingly independent Canadian provinces. The fact that constitutionally Soviet republics are supposed to be fully autonomous and even entitled to secede from the Federation is another example of the perpetual contrast between theoretical structures and political realities. In the event, the reality of power and of its internal dynamics tends to lead to a decay of the federal system. The result is either growing centralization, e.g. the USA and USSR, or else growing separation, e.g. India, Canada, and pre-coup Nigeria. The idea that political power should be concentrated in one controlling center for the nation as a whole derives from the presumption that the interests of each region are best served by decision-making in a national framework. This presumption, increasingly enough, is usually accepted only after the destruction of the local power structures. Thus it is agreed by most Englishmen and Frenchmen that major political decisions ought to be made in London and Paris rather than on a local level. But this intellectual recognition followed, rather than preceded, the crushing of the barons and of the independent states of Burgundy, Province, Anjou, and Wales. 
In many underdeveloped areas, the power of local barons is still very real, and local movements based on linguistic or ethnic affiliations are actively attempting to gain either greater autonomy or else full de facto independence. As of January 1968, the central governments of India, Burma, Kenya, Somalia, Ethiopia, and Tibet were all experiencing armed conflicts with separatist forces. Canada, India, and as admitted belatedly in a grudging footnote, France and the United Kingdom, are experiencing political conflicts with separatist elements. In Spain, Yugoslavia, and in Italy, more or less violent separatist groups are operating. Amongst all these instances, where the local population does not accept the superiority of centralized decision-making, we have to differentiate between the various possible implications for the coup. A. The regions are the real sources of power. The coup must either confine itself to one region or extend to all of them. Suppose the center must be just one more target area. This extends and complicates the coup, while the weakness of the coup's forces in each single capital may invite counter-coup activity. B. One or two regions dominate the whole country. This was the situation in pre-coup Nigeria. The northern region, ruled by traditional Fulani and Hausa emirs, was the largest region by far. Its ruler, the Sardana of Sokoto, Amadu Balo, was in full control of its internal politics, whereas in the other regions the situation was more fluid and more democratic. Thus, Amadu Balo, in association with political forces in one other region, dominated the whole federation. The young Ibu officers who carried out the first coup therefore had to allocate as much of their efforts to Balo in his capital as to the federal capital and the federal leadership. In the event, they killed both the federal prime minister, Abu Bakr Tafawa Baliwa, and Bello. They were overextended, so the Ironsi, the senior officer of the army, acting with the police and bureaucracy, staged a counter-coup and seized power on his own account. The existence of these regional forces, strong enough to control the supposed center, may make a coup impossible. If the regional or ethnic bloc is organized on tribal lines, the structures of its leadership will be too firm and intimate for a coup to function from within. One of the few stable countries of the Middle East, Lebanon, is based on such an arrangement. Christian, Muslim, and Jews blocks are all mutually hostile, but they recognize the fact that no single group can hope to dominate all the others. Thus, the Beirut government functions as a clearinghouse for those politics which are accepted by each ethnic bloc. If one carried out a coup in Beirut, it would immediately lead to the collapse of the system, since each group, backed by their own armed forces, would seize power in their own region. The coup would therefore only capture Beirut in its suburbs, and it would probably be unable to retain its control over even that small area. Lebanon provides an extreme example of the role of ethnic and regional forces. In each individual instance, there will be a particular balance of power between the regions, and between the regions and the center. The efforts of the coup would have to be allocated so as to deal with each ethnic or regional bloc on the basis of an estimate of its role in the particular balance of forces. In a few cases, a coup may be impossible because the nature and extent of regional power is such as to require resources beyond those likely to be available. Elsewhere, it will just be one more obstacle to overcome. The third precondition of the coup is, therefore, the target state must have a political center. If there are several centers, then these must be identifiable, and they must be politically rather than ethnically structured. If the state is controlled by a non-politically organized unit, the coup can only be carried out with its content or neutrality. Ethnically structured is a rather awkward phrase. It's intended to cover social groups whose leadership is evolved by clear-cut and well-established, usually hereditary, procedures. If a particular traditional leadership controls the state, we cannot seize power by carrying out a coup in the state's controlling center, nor can we penetrate the traditional leadership because we would be excluded automatically as usurpers and outsiders. In Burundi, for example, the traditional Watutsi hierarchy controlled the state, and therefore to seize power in Burundi, it would have been necessary to penetrate the hierarchy, but this would only be possible if A, we were Watutsi, B, we belonged to the aristocracy, and C, we were next in line for the succession. In Rwanda, power was also controlled by traditional Watutsi chiefs who had been subjected to the Bahutu majority. Then there was a revolution, and now the tr leadership is Bahutu political rather than Watutsi traditional. A coup is therefore now possible. If a political entity is actually controlled by a group which is not structured politically, then obviously political methods cannot be used to seize power. This is the case of a country dominated by a business unit. Imagine, for example, that General Motors did control the USA, in the sense that the President and Congress acted as its stooges. If that were the case, power would have to be seized in Detroit, not Washington. In the unlikely event that one could raise enough cash to buy 51% of General Motors' shares, then Washington would be a fringe benefit added to all the other resources controlled. But the coup is a political weapon, and its planners have only political resources. Thus, General Motors USA would be outside the reach and the scope of a coup. 
Returning to reality, Katanga in the early 1960s and the Central American Banana Republicans in the 1950s were examples of states whose real centers were politically impenetrable, unless you could relate raids two to three hundred million dollars. Thus concludes Chapter 2 of When is a Coup d'État Possible, Section 5-5, Coup d'État, Edward Lutwak. Tomorrow we continue with 5-6, The Strategy of the Coup d'État. I will see you then, alum.